word of encouragement today for you comes from Martin Luther King's scenes and untimely deaths. He said this one night in a pulpit. A man was visiting this church. He said, you got to learn to thank God for what's left. There's always enough left in life to make it worth living. With some caution, I would like to ask some probing questions to those in this room today who've experienced loss. What do you have left after all that you have lost? When this fog of mourning lifts, and one day it will, what will remain? Do you still have some of your dreams? Do you still have God's gifts and your abilities? Will you still have connections with legitimate acquaintances? Will you still have relationships with people who care for you? Do you have relatives who are overcoming the same losses also? Do you have any answers for them that they need that you already know? Do you still, will you still have a purpose when this season becomes less painful? Will you still have a purpose? Will you still have a voice? What will you have left? What will remain? i tell you one thing that will sure remain is God will make your life worth living. Find the answers to these kinds of questions with those who care for you and move forward slowly while trusting God no matter what. It is people like you who are our heroes who would agree with me. Your story is not over and you will survive. If you've experienced some kind of loss and maybe it's related to Valentine's in that it's the first Valentine since you've had the loss or maybe it's not related to this special day. But you've experienced some kind of loss in your life. Can you just raise your hand? I want to read a prayer over you. May the God of all comfort give you all the comfort you need in your sorrows. All of them. And may your friends and loved ones give you all the time you need to recover. And may the Lord one day in His timing enable you to comfort others with the same comfort with which you will have been and are being comforted. For Paul wrote in in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Father, we trust you with our hearts, We trust you with our emotions, and we trust you with our losses. We trust you. You are God, and you are God alone. (laughs) And you are God when it seems like happenstance, and you are God in every circumstance. And you are God when we fall, and God when we stand. And you are God who still holds us in your hand. So, Lord, we trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I bring you greetings from Haiti. This is the sun from Haiti. It's the most beautiful sunsets you have ever seen. That is one of Terry Snow's kids making it heart with his hand. Today, we're going to speak on our sixth question in our quest for tough questions that thinking people are asking. This may seem rather elementary to you, but I believe it's going to be encouraging to us all. So hold on. You found 1 Corinthians 5 yet? 1 John 5, yes. Slow down, slow down. Speaking of Haiti, I have a letter from Terry Snow. He said, he wrote this on Friday, an email, Yesterday, seven trailers were delivered to our campus full of medical supplies, food, tents, mattresses, clothing, etc., Many of these supplies will be delivered to various locations with partnering ministries and orphanages beginning today and this weekend. Right now, it's being distributed. Others will need to be sorted and organized for distribution amongst the volunteers currently working at our mission campus. I think three or four weeks ago, we announced that out of our tithing uh, uh, surplus, we had sent $5,000 to Haiti. And you guys on your own decided to add to that, and over 3,000 came in. Then the next week, we got our first gas check. Somebody said we should call it oil check because you know how, teen- how junior high boys are. <laughs> we got our first oil check, and it was, it was to wrap up last year. It was a little over 13 grand. 
So we put that with the money that you gave, and so to make a long story short, over 20 grand, I don't have the exact figure in my head, went to help Terry get these things. Seven trailers full of stuff. Now, uh, St. Mark's is a small harbor, so they were able to ship in 20-foot containers, but the containers had to have wheels on them. So imagine these 20-foot long container uh, trailers with wheels on them full of stuff. An ambulance, there's a picture of the ambulance, donated by YWAM, Youth with a Mission, Mercy Truck Ministries, was also with the trailers. We were all shocked when we first heard of it on the ship as we had not received updated information of its coming. Yet today it sits inside our YWAM St. Mark campus. There it is. As soon as insurance and a license are purchased, it will be deployed to be used short-term in Port-au-Prince, and it will then later be used in St. Mark here with the new hospital that is being restored and the clinic that is being built in the fifth section this summer. This ambulance is sending a message of hope and love to all Haitians, and we had a part in it. Thank you so much, Lord. I know others here have given thousands of dollars to other ministries in Haiti, and this is exciting. Hallelujah. My sister and her husband, um, someone chartered a plane with the uh, Knights of Malta, of which they're part of, and sending them to Haiti next week. So we'll get first eye information from them probably by next Sunday. So praise the Lord. First John chapter 5. John wrote, Who is he, verse 5, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Can we say what we believe? Jesus is the Son of God. This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Notice there's water, there's blood, that's Jesus Christ, and there's a Holy Spirit who overshadowed Mary when she conceived. The Spirit is truth. Verse 7 is where we're heading today. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which He has testified of His Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in Himself. He who does not believe, God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of His Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. If you believe... In the name of the Son of God, which basically is the gospel in one word, Jesus means Yahweh save me, Jehovah saves, you have, if you put your faith in Him to save you, you have the assurance of eternal life. You can know that you're saved and know that God's not waiting with an eraser just looking for a chance to rub you out. (laughs) Did you hear about the guy that made a list of all the people that he could whip? And his big buddy said, what you got there? He says, this is a list of everybody I can whip. Everybody in this town, I can whip them. So I wrote all their names down. His buddy said, well, you can't whip me. I can't. No, you can't. You want to try me? No, just give me an eraser. I'll take your name off. (laughs) How can God be one and three? Well, we can be simple and say, well, the Bible says it's so. For 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But I would like to, before we approach the Scriptures, suggest this truth. This is a question that appears to be logical but seeks to differ with the Bible. So before we look at some more Scripture, let's be logical and ask ourselves a similar question, which would be, how can anything be one? and three. Is it conceivable that something could be one and three? Without looking at the Bible. All right, we're going to question the Bible about God being one and three. So, okay, the Bible's under question. Well, let's see. Well, time 
We understand time from three points, past, present, and future. You got to watch on. If it's a standard watch, not one of those digital jobbies, you can see where your minute hand has been, and you can see where it's going. And you can use it to project, all right, five minutes from now, we'll... Overseas, they'll say half past the hour, or quarter past the hour, or quarter two. It's always in projection to the past, the present, and the future. Space, the way we measure space, the size of things is through three dimensions. Length, width, and height. Water, we can understand water in three forms. Liquid, solid, and gas. Um, Bill Cosby said the first caveman, when he experienced hail, he said, Oh, hard water. <laughs> Lemonade. Come on, they're being courteous. You, know, you don't have good lemonade if you don't have three parts to it, right? Music. You don't have good music without some melody, some harmony, and some rhythm. Did we not have some of that in here today? Yeah. <laughs> Rap is under attack. Is it, is it music? Because where's the harmony and where's the melody? And Anyway, we don't want to get into whether or not it's music. It is an art form that you might hate. All right, so we, we've asked the question, can something be one and three at the same time? And it's yes, right? All right, can a person be one and three at the same time? We're still avoiding the scriptures. Yes. I'm a father. To be a father, first I had to be a son. Then I had to be a mate. And we had to mate. And <laughs> had to have a child. Right? Right? Mother, the same way. She's got to be somebody's daughter. Somebody has to be your mate, if not for a season, for a short while or on one occasion. And a parent, a child must be born for the person to be a mother or a child chosen and adopted. To be a husband, would be three things. A biblical husband is a son-in-law. You know, God's also your father-in-law. Did you know that? Has to, be, has to have a spouse or be a spouse right. And ladies, you'll like this. Husband should be a representative of Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, I preach to myself here. A pastor should be one of the members of the church. If you're not committed to the church you're pastoring now, that's, that's a sad, sad place. A lot of guys are there. They're kind of sad. They want to change jobs. They're sending their resumes all over the country. A uh, pastor should be one of the servants of the church. If he's not willing to clean the toilet, get his hands dirty, tell you what, it's going to be a messy place. <laughs> just is, just the way it is. You hear about the pastor that retired and the new guy took his place and it wasn't long before the grass was knee high and the bushes were overgrown and the deacons had a meeting. It was one of those deacon-possessed churches. And they said, Pastor, you know our last pastor, Pastor Brown. Oh, we won't choose a name. Pastor Billy Bob. Pastor Billy Bob used to mow the grass and trim the hedges. The new pastor said, yeah, I know it, but I don't think he wants to do it anymore. <laughs> little humor there, very little. And he should be one of the leaders of the church. So you see, a person could be one and three or more at the same time. It's depending on how you look at it, how you break it down. As humans, we are made in the image of God. And the way I understand the scriptures, we are body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5, Paul said in his prayer, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your 
whole spirit, soul, and body. And I know man can be broken down into two parts as well. You can do that with God too. But the point is there's three aspects to man. Now, the difference between us and God, we are these things at the same time. We are these things. They are us. But our body one day is going to be replaced. Our mind is being renewed. And our spirit has been reborn. Hallelujah. But right now there can be conflicts. You ever been conflicted? Your spirit wants to pray. You ever, sometimes it happens. It can happen. You really want to pray. I mean, there's just an ache in your heart to pray. But your body wants to eat. And your mind, wa- your mind wants to go to that movie and be entertained. What are you going to do? I guarantee you the struggle is going to wind up being between the body and the spirit. <laughs> yeah, they have food at the movies. Yeah, they do. But $5 for a Coke and... Six dollars for a hot dog before you know it, 20 bucks, and you're just snacking around. So anyway, that's why movie taverns are in existence. (laughs) Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. That's soul, spirit, and body, joints and marrow. And is a, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The three part makeup of man is scripturally distinguishable as well as experientially. We can know by experience that we can distinguish the three parts that are within us. I want to pray, I want to eat, I want to sleep or be entertained. But while our threeness, our threeness, can have conflicts. The triunity of God is never in conflict. He is one God in total harmony with himself. So how can God be one and three at the same time? Because the Bible says so because that's how he reveals himself to us. We are not three God people. We are one God people who believe that one God reveals himself to us as Father. Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that's a mystery. Yes, it is. Let's embrace it and allow it to change our lives. We can see the triunity of God in creation. In Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So there is God. God in creation. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So God created, and then the Spirit was hovering. Then God said, there's the Word, the Father, the Word, and Spirit. God said, let there be light, and there was light. A verse in Psalm says that the entrance of God's Word brings light. You ever had a scripture just come alive? That is spiritual light. God enlightens the eyes of our heart. The threeness of God can be seen in creation. Now look, this is interesting. In verse 26 of Genesis 1, God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. God can speak of himself in plural terms and be realistic about it. You ever had someone speak in plural terms as though you were included in the promise? You know, well, we are going to paint your house for you for free. (laughs) And you want to say, what do you mean, we? What do you mean, we? You got a mouse in your pocket? In the beginning was the Word, John 1. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is with God, and yet he is God. That don't make no sense. Well, it's the truth. God's heart, God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are above our ways. Should the thing formed say to him who formed it, you're doing it wrong? Who is God in this picture? It's the temptation that goes all the way back to Eden. We want to be God. We want to 
present God in our image after our likeness when we were created in His image and in His likeness. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three pre-existed. Otherwise, God wouldn't be complete in Himself for eternity. The Son is not just some thought that He dreamed up. The Son was the Word that was destined to be made flesh. He was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So there's a purpose, the eternal purposes of God that we just hold to by faith. All things were made through Him and without Him. Nothing was made that was made. Now, I was raised with this phrase that sounded nice. God is Father in creation, Son in redemption, Holy Spirit in regeneration. That sounds great, but I'm telling you, you can't divide the three up like that. Because God is involved in creation. God is involved in redemption. The Father sent His Son. The Son dies for us that we might be redeemed. The Son raises from the dead and gives the Holy Spirit to empower us. And here the Word is involved in creation, not just the Father. You see that? All things were made through Him. Who is this? The Word. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In verse 14, I love this. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. This is Jesus. How can God be one in three? Well, I'm going to share just a few examples here of how God operates, how He reveals Himself. And if you build your life on these and get away from the Scriptures and trying to prove these points, you're going to err because you can't divide the Son from the Father and the Father and the Son from the Holy Spirit because God is one. What the Son is involved in, the Father is involved in. What the Holy Spirit is involved in, the Father and the Son are involved in. Because God is one. Just as I am one. When my spirit prays, my body is doing something. And my mind is doing something. Otherwise, my spirit can't pray. See that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father, the Word of God. The Spirit of God. The Father wills. The Son words. The Holy Spirit works. Father's will was in, was in operation at creation. The Spirit was there working, hovering over the water. And the Word was spoken. Let there be light. It's like the Father thinks, the Son says, the Holy Spirit does. In my own body, I have a brain, I have a mouth, and I'll think something before I say it. You ever said something before you thought? It's not good, not a good idea. That's our emotions taking over. And we are to do what we promise. You ever, have you ever known someone whose mouth wrote checks that their body wouldn't cash? God's not like that. He is whole within himself. What he says, he does. That this is the way we can understand him, to appreciate him. The Father is Lord God, Yahweh God, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Adonai. The Son, according to Isaiah 53, is known as the arm of the Lord. He is the arm of God. And... um, The book of Acts says that the Son went about everywhere, anointed by the Holy Spirit, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And Jesus said in in Luke that he cast out devils by the finger. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So it's as though God is God and the Son is his arm and the Holy Spirit is his finger. It's interesting that um, 
Pharaoh related some of the things he saw as the operation of the finger of God. Um, when God spoke the Ten Commandments to Moses, he wrote them in stone with his finger. He willed, he spoke, he did, he wrote. He willed, he spoke, he wrote. The Bible was written by men of God who were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. So, you able to see the threeness and the oneness at the same time? God loves sinful man. He so loved sinful man that he gave his only begotten son. So God loved sinful man and he sent his son and he lived with sinful man. And now, for those who've been redeemed, we can receive the Holy Spirit. God lives in redeemed, formerly sinful man. I love it. God is the gospel. He himself is the gospel. That's why if you don't believe in the Son of God, there's no assurance of eternal life. He is the gospel. It's the story of a father who loved his kids so much he gave his favorite kid, his only begotten son, himself, as it were. He was God manifest in the flesh, Jesus said. He's the express image of the person of God, gave himself for us through his son so that we might be made sons of God. You know that Jesus made himself one with us. He is also not only our God, he's our brother. This is incredible. It blows my mind. God sent. God went. And God sends. God sent. The Father sent his Son. God went. The Son came and died for us. And God sends. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, righteousness of judgment. He leads us the way to regeneration and redemption. And then He sends us out to reach out to those who are not in the ark of safety. See that? So we are the extension of the Godhead. We will never be God, but we work with Him. We don't need to fully understand these things to worship God. We don't have to have perfect theology to be able to pray to Him or to enter into life with Him. We don't have to fully understand the sun to enjoy its warmth, to experience its power. Deep within the core of the sun, 93 million miles away, the temperature is 27 million degrees. The pressure there is 340 billion times higher than it is here on earth. In the sun's core, this insanely hot temperature and unthinkable pressure combine to create nuclear, nuclear, nuclear reactions. In each reaction, four protons fuse together to create one alpha particle that is 0.7% less massive than the four protons. In other words, it shrinks it down to less than 1% of what it was. And this difference in mass, this pressure, creates energy at the center of the sun that takes one million years to make its way out to the outer surface of the sun and then a matter of, is it hours to reach the earth? It's incredible. But we don't have to know all that to enjoy the sun. I don't have to have perfect understanding of the triune God to experience his blessing. I don't have to understand all the aspects of theology. I think we should try and grow. But you know what? You don't have to have a degree to be a believer. In fact, there's a lot of people that have more degrees than a thermometer and they're going straight to hell. (laughs) I want us to take communion this morning. There's three aspects in a communion service. Three things are involved. The cup, the bread, and the people. 
It was not meant to be taken by ourselves. I know some people do that before they get up in the morning. That's fine. But the original context, and I don't think I'm reading into it, was a group setting. And the Lord promised to one day celebrate it with us in his kingdom. We look forward to that day. And so I want us to take it in an atmosphere of worship. All right? And so while the elements are being passed out, a, an incredible poet named Amina Brown is going to use her gift of poetry to worship on a video. So could I have some brothers and sisters come forward? There's six trays here. We can pass them out quickly. Uh, you have two and a half minutes. That's how long Amina is going to go. Channel 21, Brother Kelly. Here we go. To worship you, to honor you, to adore you is the only reason I live. To worship you, to honor you, to adore you is the only reason I live. I take your phrases and stitch them together. Wear them comfortable like an old sweater for God on my sleeve. So loved on my chest, the world on my other sleeve that he gave his only son tied around my waist. I love for you to cover me, clothe me in your integrity. Find me frequently, taking in long sips of your poetry. You intoxicate me with your eternity, and your love for me is front page news. And that's why I read you so much. That's why I need you so much. That's why I come and see you so much, because your vowels and consonants cause permanent alteration to my hopeless and sinful situation to worship you, to honor you. To adore you is the only reason I live. It amazes me that you can be eternal, internal, external, that you can be ahead of time, on time, instead of time, before time, after time, at all times, at all points, you are on point. You don't miss even a hair on my head. And for that, I love you. For that, I give you all that I am to worship you, to honor you. To adore you is the only reason I live to worship you, to honor you. To adore you is the only reason I live. The throne of my heart has an incompetent ruler without you. I look to you for the love of you, the peace from you, to silence all the noise with you, to bring tranquility to all the scattered thoughts with you. When I learn to think of you and not of me, to go so deep in you that I lose who I used to be. With you, I can be everything you intended me to be, and I lay my ability to be anything without you. I lay my preconceived notions about you. I forget about me to remember life is about you, to remember I live for your smile. I live for your smile more than I live to please the crowd. Make me like water. See through me. See you through me. Wash me of iniquity. Immerse me in purity. Help me to choose you, to lavish you with all that you deserve, to lavish you with more than words, to worship you, to honor you, to adore you is the only reason I live, to worship you, to honor you, to adore you is the only reason I live. Mm. Powerful. This uh, cup has cellophane and foil on the top. You can peel the cellophane away from the foil. You can get the, the uh, bread. And then you can get to the cup by peeling the foil away from the cellophane. I would like for two people to help me. Um, by coming forward and worshiping him for the bread and another person coming forward and worshiping him in the microphone for the cup. Worship him for the bread. All right, sister. for us, for our healing, Father. Help us to be able to break ourselves to be a representative of your love. We thank you for this. Thank you, Lord, for giving us, giving yourself for us, giving us yourself. As we're sitting here, Lord, we're remembering the night you 
instituted this at a meal sitting around a table. Thank you. All we have to do is receive. Thank you for your body. I'd rather worship him for the blood. Father, we thank you for the blood that unites us. God, the blood that covered us and the blood that cleaned us. Father, the blood that washes everything away, the dirt and the stains. Father, we thank you for the blood that washes away all of our shame. God, we praise you and we adore you for it. In Jesus' name. by singing all I need is you Lord all I need is you is you
so much for worshiping with us today. We pray that you would realize that God is available. Say, here I am, Lord, just like I am. Come and show yourself to me. Prove yourself to me. Give me the ability to believe that you're the Son of God and that you came to die for me. And as you find yourself beginning to believe the truth of the gospel, that is saving faith dawning in your heart. Step out and speak it out with your mouth. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died and rose from the dead for me. Confession is made with the mouth and with the heart. We believe in the righteousness. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you'd like to add some names, we have a little over 300 names. Add some names to the book. I'll leave it up here on the table. In fact, it will always be in here as far as if I can help it. So add names to it as you come across people's paths. And let's begin to pray for a harvest of souls. Amen. Yes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. All we need is you, Lord. All we need is you. universe.